So I, I was born here in London, uh, in North London. My mom was, she took, the, she took the boat with her best friend from Trinidad because her best friend couldn't afford the fare, the airfare, so they took a boat. We in this family are notoriously seasick, so my mother lost a stone um, in the seven week trick from Trinidad to, to, uh, you know, to North London where she was a, a, a nurse at the Royal Free Hospital for 20 years. I met my father as well there and had me. So I always like to explain that because sometimes people think that I'm just this random Canadian that came in and said, oh yeah, well, you British don't know about what's going on here, so I'm gonna give you an awards program. And actually every summer I was here. Um, and for that reason, I didn't really fit in in Canada. So I had this heavy Cockney accent. And my family still make fun of me to this day, even though you can kind of tell there's a, you know, obviously I have a Canadian twang. So they, um, you know, my mother and my father, they moved to Canada. My mom, well, first to Switzerland and then Canada. And we ended up, um, we ended up staying there. And every summer I'd come back here to the UK and then I would um, be schooled in Canada. So I was an awkward child. Uh, just re let's be really honest. I had, if, you know, really, really big gap between my teeth. My mom used to say that I used to, it looked like I chewed rocks for breakfast. <laughs> It's deep. It's deep. I know. I'm just, if you guys know West Indian families, you know like, they don't mince words. <laughs> you know they don't mince words. They tell you exactly how they see it. And so, um, and I was also really tall, and I had this heavy Cockney accent. And I, you know, I, I think the reason why I say this is because I was never really good at fitting in. And even though now it, it's done me well, um, it was a lot of heartache, a lot of heartache, and a lot of pain. Um, and I, I sought, you know, approval. I sought everyone's approval, whether it be my teachers or my mom, but it was in that seeking of approval, I was seeking love and affirmation. So again, it's, it's something that you know, most of us go through in some form or fashion, but again, it, has, I can, it goes right back to our award story and seeking the affirmation that I think we deserve as a community. So I think one of the first things about um, success for me was that ability, that, that thing of not fitting in and, and getting used to not fitting in. Um, because when you strive to fit in, then you will always kind of play at the level of the crowd. I'm not saying that fitting in is bad. I love team sports. I'm a you know, hockey player as well as a volleyball player. And I love when teams get together, especially you do girl teams. Like we were just so, it was one of the best parts of my childhood. However, I think that by, um, by the not fitting in at school and by being made fun of, particularly for my looks. What I learned was the value of your brain and your heart. So even though I, uh, later on I, I was a model in, in New York, uh, I really, I guess, didn't really fit in there either because I had a bunch of like, really nerdy friends and I'm a nerd for life. And they were, these guys were the guys with heart and they're the guys with passion. Like my little friend, Arnold Choi, who I used to study calculus with, he was, he, th those are ultimately the people that I was attracted to. Uh, because it was about the inside rather than the outside. Um, additionally, I always used to, I loved Michael Jackson, and I, well, still kind of do, that's not in the past tense. <laughs> and also I used to kind of wear wigs a lot. You know, I remember I, you know, at 13, I like came into like, high school and I went to an all white school first and then I went into a black school afterwards. And I came in with like a new wig. And, and I'm not sure if you guys realize Think about a 13-year-old child going into school with a wig, <laughs> like a bob. Like again, it's just not, it was never going to be a setup for you know popularity contest. <laughs> and a Michael Jackson outfit. Like I had the exact outfit that he wore in Rock with Me. I, I remember the dancing. I remember posing in front of the TV like he was my boyfriend, kissing the tiger and the Thriller album. If you guys know the Thriller album, he, there's this one where he's you know when he's lying. Anyone remember the t Who remembers the Thriller album? Thank you. So he's lying with the tiger. I was lying with him and the tiger. That was me and the album. And I know it was deep, but uh, we also, we had a love of music and our, our family in general, if you recognize my last name, my brothers and sisters have had quite a few albums um, out of Sony and they are, ours was a very musical family. 
But um, th what it was most importantly was a family of jokes. And so I know that any of the people that I work with, all of the co-founders of the awards, all of the people that we, you know, that are, we work with as our sponsors, it was a foundation of jokes. And I think that as part of the black community, that was so important. It's so important to our heritage. Like the way we're able to um, absorb, particularly I'm, I'm talking about from the slave culture, and um, being a, a church girl as well, the, the way that we have used jokes and music and storytelling to really heal a, an, an, an intangible pain that's been done for 400 years on our community, like I, I love us for it. And so I will always be the musical jokey one, um, even though I'm working hard in the background. And that's been key to my success, I think, because that's the, one of the brands that I try to give to my teams. I look at Ronke because Ronke's back there. She does the social media for the awards. Ronke and I started off our relationship, I think, jokes in the corner with some with alcohol and food in the in the corner. And 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 Jeffrey, I work with, and he works for Thompson Reuters, and we work with him. And but then Jeffrey and I go out for food, and we catch some jokes. We just had some jokes upstairs, and and not we're so we're so amazing. We are. I'm so sometimes I just think about our culture and our race, and I think of what we've gone through and the love affair is so deep because for us to do what we do, not only do we make ourselves laugh, but we make everyone else laugh. What we are at, we are funny people in general. We are, look at our faces just talk without us even saying anything. My mom points to other parts of the room with her lips. Like, like, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I do it too. I'm like, like that, you know, like that little thing. And we're so wonderful in terms of the expression of our, our love and our engagement and our passion and and that is, um, that's one thing that I'm so proud of. And I think that's part of my success. It's a brand that I, I proudly, and a badge that I, I proudly kind of get to. When you see people start to take that joy from you, or when you let other people take that joy from you, that's when you're in a dangerous place. And there are several times during the awards, the birth of the awards, that you know my, my friends didn't recognize me anymore. And so, um, so I think for, for yourselves, make sure that you understand what success looks like for you. For me, if I can laugh and work hard at the same time, that's my success. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I know that if I cannot laugh, then I have to be very careful about what I put my hand to. Anyway, so with the Black British Business Awards, I was here and it was during the riots. And uh, Baroness Amos and Dizzy Rascal were being interviewed on the BBC and people were asking them about the riots. And I was just like, oh, isn't that funny? You don't really have black people on your screens, but then when you do have them, you're talking about the riots. Like, but I swore I saw the Hasidic Jew in Tottenham stealing a carpet from Carpet Ride, and I didn't see that on TV. Why don't you interview those guys? Like, why is it all of a sudden you are associating black culture to the riots instead of youth disenfranchisement? You know, there was a whole lot of stuff going on with those riots that we have yet to kind of delve into. And then number two, I was so fortunate. I, it's like I met one person and all of a sudden people had introduced me to this world when I moved back to London of financial services. And seriously, every bank was having networking events. And it was like all these uh, successful black people, like the men in suits, because you know men in suits in the States is very different, right? Like they wear like really big suits. <laughs> but the men here are just like tailored. And I was like, damn, this is deep. This is what's going on. No, seriously, I'm not even gonna lie. That's exactly what happened. There was a lot of men in suits here. And I just thought, why aren't we seeing this? Like, why don't I see this on my screens at all? And so when I um, was having a conversation with one of my friends who I work with in gender, and when I do my gender stuff, my kind of, you know, women and LGBT kind of work, and she says, well, why don't you start an awards, do it yourself? I was like, dude, I don't know what to do in an awards program. I'm not running around with a headset. Like, I don't know, put up table plans, hotels. I'm not doing that. And she's like, well, we'll do it. And you know what, you just kind of bring the community together. And that's essentially what happened. I guess the key part of that story though is that it was, it was one of my closest kind of mentors, a white woman, Max, Maxine Benson. And it was a learning curve for her as well as me. So she had been running gender programs for about 13 years, excellently, every single year, on point, every single time. However, I would say that she had this little thing, and I would say most of the gender agenda kind of um, activities would, have, would represent black women particularly as hood done good. There was always something, always something. No, you know, there was just always something. There was always like, oh yeah, you know, they, 
went through really diff difficult circumstances, but now look where they are. They've worked so hard from a, despite all their circumstances. And it, you know, it was kind of like Sex in the City. I used to call them Sex in the City. I used to call her Sarah Jessica Parker because if you guys watch Sex in the City, I don't know if you realize during the actual episodes on TV, the only black women we saw were the one who got in a fight with Samantha in the middle of the dance floor, the transgender women who were at the corner of Samantha's building who were spitting on her and throwing stuff. But if you look at the black women and they're represented in Sex in the City, it was horrible. And so Sarah Jessica Parker had to come back and say, wait a minute, we've done you wrong. We have to cast my assistant as Jennifer Hudson. We have to find an amazing black woman who is actually like normal rather than what we've done to you. And we are sorry because we've given you the service. And so I think that's what's happened, unfortunately, with the gender debate. And I think that's also what happened with the ethnicity debate here, that we have this slight tinge of pity, slight tinge of we need to help you. You aren't good enough. Let's mentor you. Let's sponsor you because, you know, you're not quite there yet. But with our help, we'll help you like an avatar kind of thing or, you know, Last of the Mohicans or any pretty much any of those big block move, blockbuster movies where ethnicities are being saved by white people. And it got me really angry because I was just like, no, no, this is this has got to stop. And so with the Black British Business Awards, it was about us saying, look, we are great at what we do and actually the organizational culture that's what needs to change that's the problem not us we are exceptional you know i'm not saying everyone's exceptional i'm saying that we have to be judged on our performance solely our business performance solely rather than being judged on you know just by the fact that we're black that means that we need help because that's not the case some of us do do i say that there, there's some, some of us do need special help yeah because quite frankly no no I needed special help. I needed, you know, I needed special help. So I'm not even laughing at the people who needed special help, but I'm just saying, identify me by me saying I need help. But don't identify me and say, oh, I'm black, so I need help. Because that's not the case with all of us. <laughs> um, so that's what the Black British Business Awards are about. It was number one saying to our youth, yo, there is some amazing people doing all kinds of amazing things. And it was to, for us to say, wow, there are some amazing people doing some amazing things. But it's also about organizations and saying to them, you know what, if you're getting this, if you're missing out on this talent, it's your fault, not ours. Don't assume that we need sponsorship or mentorship or all of those things, all these extra programs that, you know. So that's a real big, that's a real big narrative change for me. So the U.S. is going there. There's a change, a maturity in the diversity conversation that we are looking for, that no longer are we, and I, I say, about this, say this about the whole BAME community, no longer are we victims, no longer are, no longer are we this target community that need help. It is about an organizational culture. It's about societal structures and power structures that need to change to make sure that you aren't behind in the global talent shortage. Because right now, you know, a lot of my finalists, they're just like, see ya, I'm out. And they're gonna go back to Ghana and they're gonna go back to Nigeria. I like bounce out to the US mm -hmm. because you're not recognizing my talent here and you're not paying me for it because I make 68% on the average white man's dollar. Really? Why am I staying? That was the, that's the issue that we really have. So when we go to Downing Street and we, it's great. Since the awards, guys, I'm not gonna lie, all of a sudden, all of these people, I'm gonna give a shout out to Jeffrey again because Thomson Reuters was our second sponsor behind EY when I left them. And, you know, <laughs> I had to leave them though. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so we've gotten a lot of, of support, but it's really hard because every single one of our organizations are having problems. Like even if they're sponsoring us, they're still having problems. So all of a sudden I've turned myself into this kind of diversity advocate and firefighter and I don't know how that happened. And so all of a sudden I become this success. And at the end of the first year, I was really scared because I wasn't just a black woman. I think you guys, it may sound wrong, but I think you guys will know what I, what I mean by that, is that you've all of a sudden become, you know, all of the business experience, gone. All of the, me being a professor or a lecturer, gone. The only thing you identified me with is that I was fighting for diversity and I, it broke my heart. And so at the end of it, I said to myself, no, well, Melly, you have dreams and my dreams was to be Oprah. So get on TV. And so then BBC was just like, we don't have enough black people. And I was like, I know you don't. And so <laughs> they were helping me out. And then Sky came and said, like, I literally contacted them myself. So I contacted 
BBC Radio 4, BBC Sky, I would look for them, you know, Red Magazine, pretty much any media contact I could possibly know. I'm like, hi, I want to be on TV. Like, I want to be Oprah, but Oprah for money. <laughs> I would actually, I have the emails, I could say it. And it was about me going after my own dream and not just being a freedom fighter, um, but also kind of making sure that the, the core and heart of me still stayed fresh. And so that's how BBC thought, hey, wait a minute, she has a really powerful voice and hey, she has like a message and you know, and then they do these, they do those little sly things like, oh wow, she's really educated and well-spoken because I'm not supposed to be, right? <laughs> Unconscious bias. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's basically how it happened. Um, but it was me pretty much tweeting people and calling people. It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't that they saw me and thought I was just amazing and they wanted me on there. It was me kind of hustling for it because I wanted to make sure that I was living up to my own expectations for myself. Um, I, the only thing that I would want to say about success is that it's hard work and you can do it. Every, like I only started just my story of success is recent really. Like I know there's all this other stuff that would lead up to it but my life is so changed in two years, guys. And I know we're talking to youth today, but I want to talk to the people who are, you know, 27 plus, who think that you have, no, who think that, you know, I thought that I was, I was wedded into a, a career of financial services or wedded, to, you know, because it made a lot more money or, you, you know, you were just wedded into the career that it's okay, you're having all the right time and you're making money, but it wasn't what you wanted to do inside, you know, it's not that dream. And so I'm just saying that from the moment that I left Ernst & Young on October 31st, 2014, 2013, and I got a dog on November 2nd, because <laughs> I wanted, that was my life. I dreamed of this life. <laughs> I got a dog so and then from then it really did take off and my life is so different and I'm so grateful and I was so scared every step of the way and I stopped buying clothes I only have like what you know I don't have it may look like I have a lot of clothes on TV but I really don't I have three pairs of the same jeans and like five of these shirts in different colors but it doesn't matter anymore because I don't eat out with my friends anymore I ride my bike every day and I'm so much more happy and and it's a hustle and it's really, really hard work, but it can be done. So that's what I want you guys to know, that it can be done. Not just the youth, but don't, don't give up on that stuff. And it's going to be a sacrifice, but it's worth it. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and watch the rest of our talks below.